Hello and welcome to this HCAM News special regarding Hopkinton's Downtown Corridor Project. I am your host Tom Nappy and today I have representatives from the town who will be addressing various questions and concerns about the Downtown Corridor Project. As many of you know, there is a special town meeting on Monday, December 9th, beginning at 7 p.m. at Hopkinton Middle School, and it was a group of residents who formed the Main Street Alliance against the Downtown Corridor Project who received the 200 required signatures on a citizen's petition to call for that special town meeting. We had originally scheduled this program for Monday with both representatives of the town and the Main Street Alliance scheduled to appear. Due to the weather this week, we had to reschedule for this evening and we invited all participants back. The town representatives are, are joining me in the studio, members of the Main Street Alliance are not. The purpose of our program is to provide an opportunity for the town to engage in a conversation about this project. I will be bringing forward questions and concerns about the project that we have collected from our community through various media channels. We have tried to be comprehensive and concise as it is our hope that tonight's discussion will help you consider all aspects of this significant project. Before we get started, I will be giving each of you an opportunity to introduce yourselves and to briefly talk about your role with the project. We'll start off with Mr. Herr. Hi, I'm Brian Herr. I'm a member of the board of, uh, sorry, select board here in Hopkinton. I still haven't got over that yet. Um, been, I'm in my fourth term and been working on this project now uh, between my time in the, at the select board as well as on the planning board probably about 15 years and uh, looking forward to the conversation tonight. All right. I'm Muriel Kramer, and I am the chairman of the planning board, and I am also here to participate and support uh, this, wow, um, the, the project and also answer questions for people if I can. Okay. Hi, Tom. I, I'm Joe Markey. I'm a resident of Ash Street, uh, about a third of a mile up from the common. Uh, I have served as a volunteer on, on boards in, in town, but I'm involved in this project st strictly as a resident and a citizen who has uh, followed it closely since we moved here in 2003 and attended all the town meetings and uh, I'm advocating for this project as a citizen. Okay, Scott. Hi, uh, Scott Richardson, uh, immediate past president of the Hopkinton Chamber of Commerce. I've uh, been very involved in uh, the review and support of this project for many years and I, we bring the uh, chamber's uh, perspective on what an enhancement this would be for the town. Okay. And I'm Matt Chase with VHB, uh, Senior Project Manager. Um, I manage a team of about 15 and we do um, different design work of corridors of this nature um, throughout Central and Western Mass. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, we'll start off with having someone give a brief overview of how this project will change downtown Hopkinton. Yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off if, if that works. Uh, um, I, as, a, as a resident, I, I, I'm a big fan of this project. I think um, the realignment of the intersection downtown is one of the main features. Uh, that will improve um, traffic flow there and safety. I, I see safety as a theme throughout this project. Um, the Marathon Way uh, will become much more safe as a frequent user of the common. Uh, I've always been nervous about that north uh, side of the common where Marathon Way shares road space with Main Street. It's kind of a big parking lot really, it's more than a way. And this will add some green space between Marathon Way and Main Street creating a buffer for users and park on the north side. Uh, there's drainage issues downtown as you drive through over the past many years. You'll see it floods when there's flash floods. It just puddles up there. We're going to be fixing the drainage there, upgrading drainage throughout the project. Uh, today, uh, it would be very treacherous to ride your bike. I actually used to ride, try riding my bike to South Street. I was hit one day in front of Town Hall, and I haven't ridden the bike since then. Uh, right now, there is limited shoulder uh, and definitely not a full bike lane width in the road. Very dangerous to ride your bike through the downtown, sharing space with cars that are moving and parked. Uh, this project will deliver a separated bike lane, my new favorite kind of bike lane since I was hit. 
um, and uh, separating the bike lane from the traffic and the parking spaces. So that's a, another benefit. Um, the way I see it, if you think back at all the private properties along Main Street uh, going back 15 years, every single one of the major properties has invested in itself, whether it's Bill's Pizza, uh, Mer uh, Middlesex Savings Bank, Hopkins and Drug, uh, Santander Bank, all have gone through major renovations to their exterior and interior, the Central Tavern. Uh, the one entity in the downtown that has not put its money down is us, the community. And this project shows a forward investment by our community in our downtown that signals to the business community that we're with you. As you invest in the downtown, we're investing in infrastructure as the community grows. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now we'll get to some of the questions or concerns that were sent to us. Uh, how much will the project cost and who is paying for it? And is there a possibility that costs could go up? And anybody could just jump right in. Do you want to take a stab at that, Jerry? You want to do that? No, 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 someone else, yeah. Okay. So the um, project is approximately uh, $15 million. Okay, so we can get into the exact dollar, but as a sales guy, I'd like to try and keep it somewhat simple. So $15 million. $8,300,000 of that $15 million is coming from the Massachusetts Department of Transportation through a TIP fund, okay? So that's money that we applied for through our state representative and state senator years ago, got that money assigned to this project through the process that we used uh, to follow through the designs. And so 8.3 million is coming from the state. $500,000 is coming from the state through a MassWorks grant. So there's another $500,000 there. $3,250,000 is coming from host community agreements that are in place uh, coming from the Legacy Farms development, as well as what was the Muse development, which is the large apartment complex uh, off of Lumber Street. So that's 2.2 that's from Legacy, 1 million from the Muse, making 3.25 million dollars. And then 3,400,000 in town borrowings. The taxpayers, we are paying for 3.4 million dollars of this 15 million dollars. We appropriated $400,000 through a town meeting article in 2010, if I remember correctly. And then we appropriated an additional $3 million uh, at uh, 2018, Article 20 of the annual town meeting in 2018. And then the easements article was heard thereafter, right after that, that was Article 47. So the article right before the easements was the article for the $3 million. And that $3 million that the taxpayers are paying for is largely the work that the state can't fund for various reasons. If it's aesthetic stuff, if it's the undergrounding, the wires, if it's trash cans along the way, if it's other things that the state can't fund through statewide tax with taxes, uh, the, the citizens have voted to do that. So that adds up to approximately $15,450,000, matching that $15 million cost for the project. Could the project cost go up? Sure. Any construction project can go up. Any construction project can go down. We had a budget for the uh, Marathon School that Joe was one of the chairs of that committee, a uh, new school that we recently built in Hopkinton. That budget came in, you guys came in under budget by how much? Four million dollars under the amount appropriated. So that budget we set for, let's say it was 25 million or 30 million dollars, whatever the number was, they got it through the contractor and through the bid process and then managing the project to have it come in under budget. Could this project come in under budget? Yes. Could this project come in over budget? Yes. The state would likely be on the hook for those items that the state is reimbursing or paying for, not reimbursing, but paying for through that 8.3 million dollars. If that 8.3 million segment goes up, I believe the state will pay for that. If, the, uh, if we buy 28 trash cans instead of 22 trash cans and the aesthetics budget goes up, we would pay for that. But we would not pay for that without going back to town meeting and seeking additional funds through a future article if we have to increase the amount above the 3.4 that we've already uh, appropriated. So essentially it can't go up unless you go back to town meeting and ask for more. For our 3.4 million, we are capped at 3.4 million. We cannot spend another dollar above what town meeting has said we can spend, correct? Okay, and that leads us to our next question. Uh, residents already voted to approve 3.4 million for the project. It was 400,000 in 2010, Article 18, and 3 million in 2018, Article 20. How much of any of that has already been spent? So I can handle that too, being the fiscal board in town. Um, to date, what we have expended is the $500,000 in MassWorks grant 
and four hundred thousand dollars in town borrowing out of that three point four million what we've gone out and spent though is nine hundred thousand dollars so the town has spent approximately nine hundred thousand dollars on engineering design and things of that nature we've not put a shovel in the ground yet obviously for the project um, but we have spent a significant chunk of the 3.4 to date. Okay, and was that expected, the 900000 up to this point? I would defer to our engineering friends on that. I mean, we are on budget for our engineering process and expenses. I, yeah, I think it's everything from a, is pretty traditional in this respect from a design standpoint for this level of project. And where we are in the project and so forth? Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. The proposed plan of the project will require property easements. Can you briefly describe what a property easement is and the types of easements this project will require? Well, we don't have an attorney here. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not going to pretend I'm one. But I have looked into it. Uh, and of course, I've got utility wires across my front yard. And I guess that means there's an easement under those wires. And what I learned in the research over the past few weeks is that not only uh, the wire, not only the pole that might be in your front yard, but if there's a pole on your neighbor's front yard and a pole in your other neighbor's front yard and there's wires connecting and those wires are over your grass, there's an easement on your yard, on my yard, for those overhead wires. So in fact, in this project, 60% um, of the easements, uh, which an easement is simply a right for someone else to access someone else's property. Um, it protects both parties. So in this project, 60% of the, uh, first I should say, the vast bulk of all the work in this project is on town-owned land. The town-owned roadway and the, what's called the town-owned right-of-way, which in some cases would surprise people. The right-of-way that's town-owned sometimes is six feet into individuals' properties. Uh, and that provides the flexibility, as you've seen in other parts of town, for the town to put in a sidewalk, for example, which they've done on Ash Street and parts of Hayden Row and other places, and on, uh, on, on, on West Main Street, too. Those sidewalks were on town road right of way. In the same way, this project, the bulk of it, is in town road right of way. However, some easements are required. 60% of the easements in this project are temporary. They're construction easements, so that um, a construction worker has a way to step on property as he's doing work on the sidewalk or the road during the course of the project. Once the project's over and closed, those easements go away. The rest, the 40%, are permanent easements. Uh, half of the permanent easements are the type of utility easements I was talking about for the telephone pole, the guy wire that holds up the poles, the wires that are strung across the poles, uh, the wires that go from the pole in the street to the corner of your house to deliver electricity to your house. It provides the utility company a way to service your home for your benefit. Uh, and in the case of the project, some of those wires that go from the pole to the corner of the house will be buried. So there will be a permanent easement where that wire is buried. But in the case where the wires are still overhead, there will be an easement in the shadow below the wire on your ground so that in case anyone needs to climb a ladder, the they'll point of clarification yeah. on that. <clears throat> um, the underground connection that goes to the houses will be a temporary easement. Temporary. Correct. Uh, correct. Yeah, not Thank a permanent you. easement. Okay, so that's also temporary. So there's, and, and just I guess a clarification, that there's um, the permanent easements for utilities are for um, the pole, the wires that you see on the poles today. When that goes overhead or um, trespasses over someone's property, that's a permanent utility easement. But the utility easements for the undergrounding, once it's connected to the house, the owner remains the property owner. It's just a temporary easement to make the connection that is now overhead to the house, it will be underground. So it's not a permanent being taken to the house. Can I answer your question on that? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, is there a cost associated with that undergrounding connection, and, and how is that getting paid for? Is that part of the overall $15 million? So that is included in the cost, and that is a cost that um, is a non-participating cost. That is um, a cost that the town has to pay for because the state won't pay for undergrounding of the utilities um, for a, a state federal funded project. Uh, specifically, the connections to the individual houses and the b businesses, that's part of it too? Yes. Okay. All in that budget. All in and, that 3.4. And, and as part of that, when we Correct. make those underground connections to the houses, um, we must make sure that the panels that are in the house can handle the new underground connection. So there could be some upgrades to people's services in order to accommodate that. And we did um, our, our accounting for that as part of this process when we go through it. So, so let's just explore that for one second. Tom, are you okay if we oh, absolutely. a little bit here? 
Um, so I just purchased a new house three blocks from the corridor project like just on Hayden Road, just up past the common. And the electric service there, the panel, was in disrepair when I purchased the house. Had it inspected, he's like, that has to go. I said, okay. So I went out and got a new service, did a whole new electrical system inside the house with receptacles and everything else. The panel, the service from the pole into the house, all that, $4,000 that I had to pay. So if somebody has to get an upgrade to their panel because their panel may be aged out or is getting close to its you know, end of life cycle and the project can come and throw a new panel in there, that's a benefit to the homeowner, a significant benefit if they've got a 100 or 200 amp service. It could be four or $5,000 easily. So something people should consider as they think about whether coming power coming underground is gonna be a problem for them it could be a nice benefit for them. Amanda, while we're talking about easements, if you wouldn't mind just kind of scrolling the color plan from west to east as we continue this discussion. I know Joe might have a couple more points. I just want to clarify. Do you want the color rendering plan or do you want the colored up easement plan where we designated each of them? Yeah, yes. and, and what Amanda's going to pull up here, uh, and then Joe, you can kind of jump back in, is going to be the easement plan from the far west of the project to the far east of the project over by the common. There's three colors on here. There's light blue, which is temporary easements. And as she scrolls, and maybe she'll scroll a couple of times, you'll see most of this is light blue. Light blue means it's a temporary easement, and when the construction is done, the easement goes away. And then there's orange, which is a permanent easement. Most of that's around the intersection straightening area with a couple of other spots along the corridor. Uh, and then there's the dark blue. The dark blue are the utility easements that Joe has described uh, we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. So maybe if you kind of scroll that a couple of times as Joe sort of finishes yeah. up his thoughts. Yeah, I guess I'll finish with questions because I, I don't claim to be an expert on this stuff. But um, again, a half of the, the, the count is that half of the permanent um, easements are uh, related to utility easements. And then the other half of the permanent easements are non-utility. And then as we look at the permanent easements that are not utility, uh, by my count, two-thirds relate to five properties. And I think those are the properties around the main intersection, the Sunilco and the Cross Point, and a couple others. So maybe you can identify which those are. And then other than that, the other permanent non-utility easements, uh, I believe 11 are related to 11 individual properties, one each, and they're mainly pertaining to sidewalk easements. Is that right? Or do you want to walk us through? And so I, I can certainly go through the project um, from beginning to end. Um, at the very beginning limits, we aren't taking temporary easements for the first couple of properties that are within the limits of work. However, as we go along, as Brian mentioned, the light blue is temporary, the orange are permanent, and then the dark blue are permanent utility easements. So the orange are taken for a variety of reasons. Um, you've mentioned two of them for sidewalk purposes or for the realignment of the roadway at the major intersection. Um, at, this, at this location, there are a couple of smaller ones for, for signs or for, for mast arms for the signal at this intersection or for at this particular case. Um, this driveway is being included as part of the, the signal timing. And so they have a loop being placed in their driveway so it will also call the signal. So there's a permanent easement there so that can be maintained so um, if i could interrupt for one sec so their driveway is going to call the signal meaning they'll be able to get out of their driveway so, so they, they can stop in other directions so they can get out correct okay thank you so so that one's kind of an individual case um there are also permanent easements these orange ones here are for, for sidewalk or for the roadway um and then as you mentioned the the overhead wires are also um something that we we take permanent utility easements for at this location here this one is for a guy um, wire and pole um, in many cases these are already existing but because either it's an undocumented easement or we've shifted the location we're taking a new permanent utility easement so through here the utilities are remaining above ground so the majority of these easements on this side of the roadway that are the dark blue are for the aerial because we're relocating the utility poles, which are currently right at the edge of the roadway, sometimes in the roadway, to the back of sidewalk. So there will be a greater separation between the utility pole and the vehicles. It's a safer place for the poles to be. But as a result, the overhead wires are now crossing people's properties. We're requesting easements for that. Um, on this side of the road, it's 
it's majority just on the southerly side of the road, majority just temporary easements. Again, that's for grading purposes, to reconstruct the driveways if we must, um, and just for access for the construction workers to do the work that is proposed. Same situation through here. Again, there's a lot of dark blue along the back here. This is for aerial. There are a handful of locations that are for, for utility poles and for guy wires. This is for a wire that's crossing to go to May, uh, Mayhew Street, one of the side streets. At this corner, we're placing in new um, accessible ramps. So we are taking small permanent easements at this location to make sure that the wheelchair ramps are within the public right of way. Again, um, mostly temporary easements in this area. There is a very small sliver of a permanent easement across here um, just for minor widening of the sidewalk in order to maintain a minimum sidewalk width to meet Mass DOT standards. When you say a minor width there for that sidewalk, how many inches is that, feet is that roughly? So it varies from basically an inch up to at the widest point about a foot. About a foot? Yeah. There's a, there's a little kink in the uh, layout line right here. So we're smoothing that out. This is for the new, um, this, this permanent easement here is for the new signal post for the new hybrid signal that's going in at this location. It will act as a flashing beacon for pedestrians to cross as well as provide the police department and the fire department access to get their vehicles out quickly. It will, it will call a signal, they can press a button and then they'll be able to access, it will stop the traffic on Main Street to allow them access out. So that's a, a, a major safety improvement. Amanda, why is the temporary easement so wide on that lot or two right this there? This one here? Um, so part of it is because we are putting in the Opticom system, which is what um, they'll use to trigger the signal. So we have to run conduit into their property. In addition, this is in the area where the undergrounding is beginning, and we have to run a new underground um, connection to these buildings. So we're taking um, temporary easements up to the building face at this case. Which property is that? The this fire is the station? fire station. That's the fire station. This is a town okay. property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would like to point out as Amanda goes through this, the, the light blue area, those are the temporary easements. And about 65% of that area is used for a convenience area for the contractor to actually do his work, perform his work. There's a good chance that he may not even access that full area of the easement, yeah. but it's provided just for the convenience of, of doing that, making that work. And the, the state makes us provide that extra buffer for that convenience so they're not working from one side all the time. Matt, we've all driven around Massachusetts and seen these projects elsewhere being done. And one thing that I see that I'm more, a little bit worried about is the staging of piping, the staging of construction vehicles in the evening, things like that. How are we going to manage that in our downtown area? Are we go, is that, does that easement allow for piping to be staged overnight and things you know, for drainage and so on? So, <laughs> so we don't really have um, much of a say in terms of how the contractor does things. We give him information. There's going to be a mass DOT resident on site that will be observing the work and giving direction to the contractor. The purpose of these easements is for, for access. It is not set out as a staging area. Typically what the contractor will do is they will find land nearby that they will then work out a lease with the property owner in order to utilize it during construction. So they'll use that for their equipment and their yard. They would work that out individually with wherever they identify as a location they'd like to have their, their field office located. So we're not going to have stacks of pipe along they, in front of the fire station or in front of these folks' homes where it's a 10 foot easement? They, they should not be doing that. I will note that they might, during the process of when they're actually physically out there working yeah. on that, they'll probably have the materials there as they're working. Yeah. But it wouldn't be long-term storage of materials. It's not meant to be them holding it as a holding area. It's meant for temporary access to actually construct the work. As far as the construction on these easements, do you know if there's going to be construction at night that may interfere with people who uh, have these easements going into their property? So right now, the hours are set from 7 to 3 p.m., which is the standard hours. They are not supposed to um, do work that will interfere with travel with during the peak hours, which have been defined as 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., and then again from, I believe, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. However, 
there is language in the contract because it is imperative that we try and get this built as quickly as possible and there are several utilities that are being placed underground. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in a very small area. The contractor can request to do night work. However, they cannot do the night work without the prior approval of the town and the select board. So it would not be uh, something that you would be caught unawares about. They would have to reach out to the town to get prior approval before they do any night work. Okay. And this leads us to another question that we got sent in. Uh, one of the concerns about the easements was that in some cases they will affect property value more than the compensation being offered for property owners. Can any of you address this concern? I guess that must be referring to the permanent easements. Because yes. We just discussed that temporary easements are temporary, and that's 60% of them. And then of the ones that are permanent, half are utility easements. So those are the type that are already in place today on a lot of these properties, including mine. And most of us have utility lines overhead, so there's an easement there already. Mm -hmm. So they must be talking about the other permanent easements that are not utility easements, which again are affect a small number of properties. So maybe, maybe Brian or someone else can talk about the permanent non-utility easements. You know, I'm not an appraiser. Uh, we, we are hiring professional appraisers and probably getting a couple different appraisers involved to make sure that we get fair market value figured out for everybody. Um, but I can only speak from personal experience. I had a water easement uh, in my property that I recently sold in town. And that water easement ran right across the back of the yard. Uh, and you know, we had a very extensive process to sell the house uh, to the new uh, owners who are great, great neighbors and great people. Uh, but they were very thorough in their due diligence about the property. And the easement was about a three second conversation. And all the other questions were about three weeks, right? So they recognized there was an easement on the property didn't change the price of the house that we were negotiating, didn't change how the price settled out, nothing, none of that. So from my personal experience, I didn't see that. It was, it was, it was you know, th there was a lot of money involved. Uh, the house I recently bought in town has easements on it for utility, overhead wires. And uh, it wasn't even discussed as part of the process. It wasn't discussed with the appraiser for the bank. It wasn't discussed at any way, at any time during, during the dialogue or the process I just went through buying and selling a house in town. There's easements all over Hopkinton. There's easements all over Massachusetts. Do they affect the property values? I don't know. There's so many of them. I personally have not seen that. Uh, maybe a professional appraiser would have a different opinion, but if he does or she does, they're going to let those homeowners know, and they're going to get the fair market value for that, for that for the easement that's granted. And, and I do want to know, as part of this whole process, there, there are federal guidelines laid out. The town is following them. They've hired an appraiser and a review appraisal, which is required. And the appraisers will be the ones that are determining how, um, how to compensate people. And we as designers in the town, they are not making those decisions. It is being handled by a separate party. And, and when they are prepared to share that information, it will go out to the owners. There is also a process in place. If the property owner doesn't agree with the assessed value, um, there is a, a process in place for, for them to contest it. And then it will go through through the legal system until a compromise is made it will not stop the project from happening right but it, it is um, something that there are contingencies and, and plans in place mass dot has a process for for, for the right of way and, and the town is complying with that process so so there's protections for pe for the citizens that are getting these easements yes and 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 um you know, like I said, we, we're separate from that process, but, but the town is following MassDOT's guidelines for that. I just want to um, follow up with a question on that. Um, and, yeah, um, I feel like I'm asking all the money questions. Um, that money that may be um, determined that is owed to property owners, is that part of the overall cost? I just want to make sure. I think that there's an, um, an allowance of, of sort in that number that's in there as of as of the numbers today until the appraiser values come out. It's, we don't have the exact number. Do you know what the allowance is? Uh, I don't off the out of the three, of my it's, head. That would be out of the 3.4 million? Yes. That is I, if I remember correctly, and I'm kind of looking out to one of my friends in the audience <laughs> that might know this off the top of his head. If I remember correctly, I thought the number was originally budgeted at $350,000, somewhere in that range. 
Um, and if it's more than that, it'll be more than that. We'll have to adjust some other things. If it's less than that, it'll be less than that, and we'll adjust otherwise. So, you know, again, we could always come in $4 million under budget, like the schools, or not $4 million, obviously, but because it's not that big a job. <laughs> or we could have at higher appraisal amounts and that would shift monies from other things to that. So we'll, we'll figure that out, but we don't have all those answers just yet. But either way, it's based on formal appraisal process yes. governed by law. Yes. And, and, and this happened to us on another project, but if there is um, an agreement cannot be made between the property owner and the town to acquire the property, the town has the right to take the property by eminent domain while it goes through a court process to um, figure out the legal ramifications of cost or negotiating costs or even if they disagree with the market value they have the right to um, you know go through that process but the town also has the right to take it up to buy eminent domain until that's figured out and uh, we had this happen on another project where the town ended up doing it for half the project and then negotiated with them as the project went through the bidding process before construction started. What, you, can I ask for a clarification on that because when you sure. use words like taking in eminent domain that's what really gets people it, it does, into a, a scary spot. Mm -hmm. And can you s s clarify that in regards to temporary easements, utility easements, and you know the vast majority of what we have up here? Yeah. Are you talking about, when you say taking, you're saying applying a temporary easement? Um, it's, so in order to put the project out to bid, the town <laughs> has to demonstrate to an SDOT, the state, that all the easements, temporary, permanent, permanent utility easements, um, are all acquired, and that is a box that needs to be checked in order for the project to be bid. Mm -hmm. If it's not checked, then the project can't go to bid, and then the money's compromised, they, you can't capitalize on the 8.3 that's available from the state. Um, then that is a process that is um, that happens before the design process is complete. Um, and then from there, uh, if a negotiation cannot be completed, the town uh, and the state, they give towns the right to, to um, pursue that option so that the project can stay on track, so the design can finish, so the project can go out to bid while that negotiation continues. Yeah, I think it's important that we use specific words like applying an easement, because the easement is not ownership. The town right. isn't owning anything. Right. The utility doesn't own your yard. You yeah. own your yard, mm -hmm. but there's someone else, another entity that has a right to access it for a specific purpose. Right. And, and whenever we can use that word instead of taking, I think it's more accurate and it, it provides a little more clarity. I understand it checks the box that all the easements are in place. I think it's a legal term. Yeah. Whether we like it or not, it's yeah. a legal right. term. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I think that you have to use the appropriate terms and the legal terms and, and confront It's fine to, confront to, it's the fine to use impressions yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's and right. I don't throw yeah. that name out there to scare mm -hmm. anybody, but yeah, that's yeah. the terminology that the state will right. use. Got and it. it'll right. be brought to someone's attention at some point if someone does dispute or want to try to stall the project because they don't want to give any, they want to you know, be reversed right. for an easement. Yeah, it, it's important. On the flip side, we have town-owned property that currently appears to be people's front yards, but it's actually town-owned property, mm -hmm. right? Just like if you were to do an addition on your house and you find your neighbor's shed is actually on your, on your side of the lot line. You talk to your neighbor and say, actually, that's my yard, and he has to move his shed, and then you build what you want it to build there. We have situations like that today as a town where we own road right-of-way but haven't used it. So people's lawns have grown on top of it. These are a couple feet probably. Uh, but those are things that we're talking about as we're building in the right of way. But it may appear in some cases, correct me if I'm wrong, are there cases where somebody's front lawn is on town road or right of way today and we're gonna use that as road or in sidewalk? The, yeah. In several mm -hmm. cases, that, yeah. is, that, is the, it, that is exactly what's happening. And in some cases it is only one or two feet. In others there's five or even ten feet of space that people are currently utilizing as their front yard that is in actuality part of the public right-of-way. Now because we are doing widening um, in some parts of the project and we are adding in bicycle accommodations and in some areas there are no sidewalks at, at the current time and we're including sidewalks, that means we do have to recover that right of way and use it for bicycle accommodations and sidewalk accommodations. So um, if the sidewalk, or in this case at the intersection where we're realigning the roadway, the roadway itself is going beyond the public right of way, we are showing a permanent easement. 
um, if, the, if the permanent easement is not required on your property, it's because the sidewalk is actually within the public right of way. And it's scary. I, I know that a lot of people, um, you know, they're maintaining it. They think it's theirs. But in actuality, legally, the public right of way is where the, the layout line has been designated and, and we'll, we're doing our best to stay within the public right of way. It's my yeah. understanding that the last time we did a public right of way layout was that in 1950? Is that what I saw in the plan so, somewhere? So some of these um, layouts, and I, I was just going to mention this, is some of them, the, the layouts are, a lot of these roads were set in the 1800s, 1900s. Yeah, this, this is uh, right here. Like I just zoomed in on the right of way plan here. This current layout for, for Route 135 for Main Street, it was a county layout laid out in 1884. It varies in width. Um, some places it's 60 feet wide. So if the existing roadway is only 30 feet and two five-foot sidewalks, they have an extra 20 feet of right-of-way that they haven't utilized yet. So um, it, it, and it does vary in width out here, um, but, but the layouts do vary um, from year. Some, this one, um, Cedar Street, was laid out in 1851. So they, they are um, old in some cases, and, and they have been updated over the years in other areas. Um, but these have been uh, in place for and, years. And it is, um, we, we, this is a common thing that we see in our projects because when the layouts are established in the 1800s and 1900s, you know, whether it's a 60, 80 foot right of way, um, people are accustomed to seeing the edge of roadway as being, oh, that must be where the property mm -hmm. line is. Mm -hmm. And when you think about how these roads were laid out for horse and buggy or whatever the accommodations were then, the cross sections could be, you know, tighter. So mm -hmm. as um, traffic becomes more prominent and a uh, variety of different users use the road, whether you're walking or biking, um, you, the cross section creeps and starts to increase of the pavement or the usable area from the 1900s to what the current standards are. And that's where we see people seeing that, well, my curb's moving in, so you must be taking my property. When in fact, a lot of people don't realize that the first 5, 10, 15 feet or whatever it is to get to that 80 feet, 60 feet or whatever the roadway cross section is, it becomes a little surprising. Um, so I, just I think it's, a, it's important to recognize the technical aspects of what you're describing in terms of the right of way and these various widths and things like that. But I also think it's important to recognize that we've got folks that have lived along this corridor, some of them for 40, 50, 60 years, and they're used to seeing that grass. And, and I spoke with one of them, I've actually spoken with several of them recently. Uh, one of them you know, was at, the, at, at an address where there's that stone wall and we've got to move it. We were going to move it five feet per Mass DOT plans recently, and we went back to Mass DOT with your help, and we're only moving it two feet now. So we're trying to be as accommodating as we can. There's certain places where we can accommodate a little bit. There's other places where we can't because of the design and sort of the technical parameters. But for all those technical reasons, we still can't forget that they've looked at this front lawn for a long time, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we have to be patient and try to get people to understand that. At the same time, we still have a job to do. So it's, it's a difficult process, but if, I think if we explain it to people calmly uh, with the facts, I think that helps the process. And, and I would just like to add that um, the process that we're at now, where we're troubleshooting, I should say, or working out the kinks of the design with the property owners, where we're refining, this is, the, this is the process. This is where this happens. It's not like we're, we missed a step or that um, we forgot to do something. This is when this happens. Um, and we're right at the point, right, where every project where we see it, where we start to enhance and change and tweak and do this. And so this is the norm. This is um, kind of where we should be on, on, on resolving this. And, and so I just wanted to point that out because. Um, the other thing um, I just wanted to say is that this is the existing right of way, and it's not being expanded, even though it feels like um, it's, it, there, it, there are changes that are coming for some people and it feels perhaps like the right of way is being expanded, but this is the legal existing right of way and it's not being expanded and won't be expanded. It just impacts people's perception of their property line. It, well, in the cases of like we were stating, there are being uh, permanent easements taken, which are yes. changing yes. where the, road, the use yes. in certain yes. areas. Yes. But, in the case of like what Brian mentioned, where there is a property owner that ha had you know a lot of green space between the back of sidewalk and their their home, and they didn't realize that some of it was actually public right of way, 
in that case, no, we're not changing the use. That is the legal definition of where their property began. We're not changing that, but we are doing our best to minimize the impacts if possible to these people and to stay within the legal boundaries of what is already defined as roadway layout wherever possible. All right, thank you. Uh, has there been any recent changes to the project heading into the special town meeting? It's probably a good segue. I think we're just talking about some of the, the feedback that the project is getting from people who live along the project corridor and based on their feedback adjustments were being made. Yes. I know one because I've been following the bike lane closely in a very earlier draft of the design there were two bike lanes now there's one and I recall why that is it's because having one with a bi-directional on one lane takes up less width than if you had separate lanes one on each side of the road we got feedback back in the 25 percent stage the town got feedback that we wanted to preserve parking and minimize encroachment into what people consider their front yard. So to do that, it's, it's, it takes up less width to have one bi-directional lane than two, mm -hmm. one on each side. But I think there's probably been a lot of talk with property owners that the project managers could outline. Yeah, Matt, do you want to touch on some of the adjustments that we've made uh, where we can to accommodate Amanda folks? has a list that summarizes them. Um, I mean, there's probably about 16 or 20 that we've really focused on um, when there's a request that the town receives. Um, you know, we work very closely with town manager and town engineer to go through um, and, and do our very best to try to, you know, design to, let, to lessen the impact or to see if we can come up with something more unique that, you know, we might have, uh, we, we, like you said, people live here for 40, 50 years, so they're seeing things that we might see for three or four years. Um, so those are some of the things, but I know, you know, Amanda's got a list if you wanted to run through a couple. Well, one of the challenges we have before Amanda gets into some of the details, one of the challenges we have in general is we, we, there's been some talk about it. It hasn't been a transparent process, right? Uh, that's been some of the discussion in town and that the, we've been keeping information from people. Um, we have, um, and we can show it at town meetings as well, we have a, uh, we've compiled a list of all the public hearings, public meetings, board of selectmen meetings, select board meetings now, planning board, I like how I transition that a little bit. Okay, nice job, nice job. I like uh, planning board meetings, uh, capital improvements committee meetings because things had to go before them before town meeting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's about 84 or 86 entries uh, of, of, of processes and, and action items that the town took with a lot of input from the residents to make this happen to where we are today. Um, but one of the perceptions is we're changing the plans. We keep changing the plans so that the residents can't keep up with the changes in the plans. But we're changing the plans based on the input we're getting from the same residents. So we're trying to be as accommodating as we can, but sometimes that's kind of coming back to bite us because we're changing the plan. We're not changing the plan to get somebody. We're changing the plan wherever we can to accommodate people. And um, I can tell you one story in particular. It's at uh, the west side of town here where that stone wall is. Uh, the folks have been very concerned about this. We met with them the other day. Prior to that, the VHB folks worked very closely with um, a MassDOT, and we, instead of moving that wall five feet in uh, towards their house, we're only going to move it in two feet now. Whether we had moved it five feet or two feet, we're still in that right of way we've talked about extensively here this evening, but we're trying to accommodate them as best we can. We also talked about providing additional screening on the east side and west side of their property to help soften the view as they get a little, the road come three feet closer to their house. Um, and finally, because we've had so many changes and there's this trust thing, okay, there's a trust thing out there, there's a lack of trust thing with some folks in town about their elected officials and, and their professionals working this project, we said we would put it in writing to them now. We're ready to get to that point where we can say, this is what will happen. It will only move two feet. We will regrade that new wall. We will put in plantings. And we put that in writing to them through the town manager's office. Um, so it's, it's a little hard when people don't trust their elected officials that we're trying to do the right thing on behalf of people. But when we can and we can put it in writing, we will do that as well to prove to people that we're trying everything we possibly can. So maybe if we show a rendering of that 5 West Main while Matt says yeah, something. Yeah, before you, and you can definitely bring that up, but I just want to speak a little bit on the process and again, just kind of like the, the transition of the project and the process. Um, the, there's, it's a five-step design process with Mass DOT. 
So there's a 25% design, a 75% design, a 100% design, and then there's a plan, spec, and estimate, and that's usually a two-step process in, in its own. Um, the project had a design public hearing in January of 18, um, and that was a 25% design. Um, following the review of the 25% design by MassDOT, um, there were comments from MassDOT to say, well, look at this, look at this, look at this. Okay, but you, you have enough. Go ahead to public hearing to get the, the um, public's, you know, to, to present the project and show them that this is the concept we're moving forward and get feedback and make any changes and whatnot. Um, after we received the comments from all of that um, and advanced to the 75% design, the 25% design is more of a two-dimensional you know, we check some three-dimensional grading and things to make sure that we don't have significant impacts adding walls or taking out, you know, walls or whatever. But the 75% is where we do a lot of our grading and we get into the real fine design. And when we transition from the public hearing to 75% design, we had to go back out in the field and collect survey. We had to get more survey on Wood Street and a, and a bunch of others, the library. I mean, there are a lot of things that changed that we needed to collect data and basically do our three-dimensional design, figure out where our grading would end and would define our easements. And so we went through that process, and there were some people that were impacted, uh, new people that were impacted that weren't impacted at the public hearing, some people that didn't get impacted as much, um, and that's part of the process. We wouldn't have known that information had we not received comments from the Mass DOT, heard from the public, or even gotten additional survey. So we, we received that additional survey earlier this year. The 75% submission went in March, and then at that point, more people were contacted because they were now affected because we had that data and we finished in another advanced design phase for our project. And so the next phase for us is 100% and this is where we work with the abutters to troubleshoot, fine tune, enhance, tweak, and that's where we're at now. So that's just a little bit of the process to get to here. It's, and again, not that we didn't miss anything, but I felt it was important to state that because I feel like some people feel like, you know, we've identified impacts that they should have been identified before the public hearing at 25%, but honestly, we would not have known what those impacts are until we've gotten feedback, comments, or even that additional survey. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit of, about the process. Again, the chamber has been very supportive and uh, um, proactive on really kind of coordinating several meetings. Over the past six years, we've had five uh, meetings that we've invited a lot of the businesses and residents along the corridor to attend. And right at the beginning, we got a lot of good input, input, primarily on we're losing way too many parking spaces. And you remember some of the early additions we were losing over, I think, close to 28 parking spaces. And that was a huge pushback from uh, the businesses, obviously, and the people downtown. So we really kept pushing that and r r went back and forth uh, a couple times with uh, VHB on say, hey, we, can we do something over here, and so on. So I think that they heard loud and clear from our members uh, and also just the accessibility and the uh, some of the impacts around the common. Uh, but obviously at this point, again, they've taken that to heart and we have basically almost a balance of parking uh, between what's there now and what's proposed. Granted, there are some, a lot of them are in a different location, but at least we have about the same parity of parking because um, that is a huge uh, aspect of the success of any business in the downtown. Um, also, again, just the, uh, again, the overall improvement of the sidewalks, the curbs, uh, street furniture, and so on. I don't know if anybody has been through Medway lately, uh, 109. Uh, they went through this process uh, over the past couple of years, and while it was underway, we all know there's going to be some pain. But right now, they're pretty much substantially done, and the uh, overall improvement along 109 in Medway is phenomenal. Um, it's, it, I'm looking forward to seeing how Hopkinton the corridor can look as good as that. So, two cents. Um, so, uh, back to, to your original question about what things have changed. This is a, the prime example that Brian was talking about just a moment before at, at West Main Street. Um, one of the things we did at this location, originally we were proposing a five-foot shoulder uh, for bicycle accommodations, and we were um, shifting the wall back five feet from its current location here. Um, what we did instead was held the three-foot existing shoulder for a longer distance and did our widening closer to the intersection for the bicycle accommodations. We looked at, um, you know, placing the wall directly at the back of the sidewalk and that between those two things we were able to reduce the impacts in front of this property. Again, we, we did up this rendering to show, like the town had said, that they would provide some sort of 
um, screening for this property owner, whether it's it's arborvitae or or fence, they're they're working with the property owner to make sure that that their concerns are met. Um, in the, this area, I just want to go back to the board. So um, this is the same location in 2D plan view, like aerial. Um, this is the area I was talking about. So, so we narrowed the shoulder slightly and then started to widen it after that property to minimize the impacts at 5 West Main. The, um, the project looked at several other alternatives. We, we considered as many things as possible to try and minimize and at the same time still provide the accommodations we need to to maintain um, mass DOT standards and still provide the the rest of the town with the, the things that they need and, and things that came out of like the road safety audit such as the left turning lane at this location. Another change that was made between 75 percent design and now is we took another look at this location um, to minimize the, the, the changes that were required to these par parcel owners. Um, we slightly narrowed the sidewalk, looked at placing curb at the back of walk so we could catch the grade more quickly. So now we no longer need temporary easements from these people. Um, uh, at this location, there, this was where we were originally proposing to start the, the separated bike lane, two directional separated bike lane. But this property owner here was experiencing very, very significant impacts. They came back to the town. We worked with MassDOT to um, come up with a solution that would still provide bicycle accommodations, still provide a connection to the center trail, but minimize impacts to these property owners. So um, instead, we've created a transition from where we have on-road bicycle accommodations to an eight-foot shared-use path which then transitions at the center trail to being the two-way bicycle lane. So we, we did a lot of things in this area to try and accommodate the, the abutters that were most impacted and that expressed their concerns. Um, one of the other things I do want to note, this property owner, originally on the 75% design plans, we were requesting a small permanent easement from them for the installation of a proposed bicycle repair station. Um, during one of the, the two public outreach meetings we held in August, it came to our attention that he was not in support of that. So we took that to heart and we shifted the location of the bicycle repair station to be closer to the center trail and located within the public property and it is no longer on his land. So wherever possible, we try to make sure that you know, we're not creating impacts to the abutters that they're, that they're not comfortable with. Um, obviously, we can't always do that. but. In this area, we were able to make several accommodations. Right. Through here, um, there were a few other changes that were made. We met with property owners. Um, we're looking at the parking at this parcel at the, the direction of the abutter. Um, we've come up with plans to show him for, for restriping. At this location, we um, added in this bump out um, where the curb extends. Um, so we were able to redesign the wheelchair ramp and we no longer required a, a permanent easement at his property in order to install the wheelchair ramp. So we do have to still remove and reset his fence, but it's going to go back in the exact same location that it is now. Um, at this parcel, um, there's an existing utility pole that is a service pole for them. We've worked with them to place the utility pole within the public right of way. So there's this weird jog easement here. The purpose of that is so that we can remove the pole that they requested we remove. So we've worked you know, with the, the owners along this portion of the corridor as well, made some accommodations. Um, up here at, um, this is the fire department. Um, we've been working with the fire chief and the police.